place in the field, some is on the way, some is shining now, don't hide away. Find the right wine, take a sip, drink down. Take a long walk out by the ocean, drift on, drift on. Hey guys, this is Nurse Howie, and I'm here to talk to you about the OSCE practical exam for student nurse practitioners. That happened today, and I will tell you why it's important, what I did to prepare, what happened, and any notes that I have afterwards. All right, thanks a lot, you guys. Bam! Hey guys, so today was the Nurse Practitioner OSCE exam. I don't remember what exactly the abbreviation is called, but it's OSCE. Basically, we have an entire advanced assessment course, which is different from when we were trying to get our registered nurses uh, license. Um, there we did a pretty thorough assessment, um, but in the field when we're RNs, we usually do just a quick head to toe. Um, I just check to make sure that I listen to the heart and lungs and listen to the stomach and then check to make sure that the fingers and feet have pulses and they can move and have, have sensation. And then just check and look at the eyes to make sure that the patient's you know, alert and oriented. And that's pretty much it for the registered nurse. Um, assessment, you know, just a nitty gritty, make sure that the patient doesn't have any wounds, so they can talk to you, and they can move all their arms and legs, okay? And have a beating heart and <laughs> a working lung. Um, and uh, for this time, as nurse practitioners, we have to change that role. And so that means is that when we go to assess our patient, we're usually not in the hospital. We may be in an outpatient clinical setting, like an urgent care place or um, you know, place where you don't have a lot of nurses go walking around to help you. Um, so unless you're working exactly in a hospital and instead if you're working in a clinic, um, you have to make sure that you really thoroughly assess this patient. However, there's a stipulation. You have less than 20 minutes to do it. Um, if you don't have allotted a whole one hour to do a physical exam on a new patient, usually you're given only 20 minutes. And in those 20 minutes, you have to be able to make sure that you check all the red flags in order to rule out anything that this patient may have. You know, coming off the top of my head, you need to make sure that the patient doesn't have cancer and that you've done the necessary tests. Or if the patient has any chest pain, you need to make sure that it's not a heart attack or a stroke um, or any GI bleeding, stuff like that. You know, you have to make sure that the patient doesn't have any of these and that they, you narrow it down to a justifiable diagnosis so that you can treat the patient and then send them off on their merry way. So before we go into that, we have to go into, we have to finish a certain amount of hours. Now, many of us have already been registered nurses for quite a while uh, and we've logged in hundreds of hours there, but for nurse practitioners, we have to have around 600, 500, 600 hours as nurse practitioner students. Uh, following and shadowing either a physician or PA or another nurse practitioner in our specific specialty. So to do that, we have to pass this course called the Advanced Assessment Course, which is for assessing patients again, but this time more thoroughly. Um, another thing I forgot to mention is that after we examine the patient, we also have less than 20 minutes in order to write a complete SOAP note. Um, this is a note where we talk about the subjective objective, what our assessment and diagnosis is, as, far, as well as our differential diagnoses, and then the plan that we're going to give the patient. And we need to write this stuff down immediately, before, hopefully before the patient goes. You know? So that's the main meat and potatoes of being a nurse practitioner, and you need to be able to do this in the field so that when you shadow somebody, you're not a burden. <laughs> Getting preceptorship as a nurse practitioner is a nightmare, you guys, because not everybody wants to pick up nurse practitioner students because there's not enough nurse practitioners. And, you know, doctors and physicians assistants may see you as competition, even though you really, really want to learn from them. And I really, really want to learn from all kinds of interdisciplinary uh, specialists. But, you know, even if they're nice and they don't think you're a competition, you are a burden and you cannot be a burden to them. So you need to know your advanced assessment skills and how to write a soap note that will generate revenue and will not hurt the patient and make sure that you don't leave anything that's that's completely um, uh, that's a complete red flag make sure that you hit all those things okay so um, if we do those then we can graduate the class and then we can go out and get a preceptor so hopefully now there's a I think it's called MERF's law or whatever that nurse practitioner schools have to get preceptorship, but it's still a nightmare. I can't imagine how nurse practitioners before this were able to get their own preceptorship, but I'm sure it would have been like terrible and time consuming and 
I don't know, it costs a lot of money, but nowadays schools are required to do it for you, but that does not necessarily mean that you can go where you want. If you can find your own nurse practitioner preceptor, um, physician or physician assistant that's more than willing to help you for free, um, then yeah, tell your school about it. You're actually an upper level, you know, you, haven't, you, have, you have the advantage compared to your other classmates. So it's kind of a race against time. <laughs> um, anyway, so this course, the OSCE, we go over the head and head to toe um, physical assessment. Of course, we start off with the general exam, which does everything from the head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat, cranial nerves, um, uh, mucous membranes, EOMI, stuff like that, hearing, um, palpating, lymph nodes, and then listening to the heart and lungs from the front to the back, six lobes in the front, seven lobes in the back, checking to make sure that they have good tactile fremitus, which is just many, just a myriad of the small tests, that you, you, multiple tests that you have to do. I'm sure all the, all the doctors and PAs are all very familiar with this too. Um, and uh, checking to make sure, the, uh, oh, you, and they have to do it in order to inspecting and then auscultating before you palpate the abdomen. Um, then you check in the genital urinary areas and then the rectum if you have to and then the pulses and then you have to go all the way down with the legs to make sure that there's sensation, strength and range of motion and don't forget the neural exam as well as psychosocial issues because of course we're technically holistic practitioners. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's many more of that. But you go through the basic, basic thing that would normally take you an hour. Um, and then sometimes we'll dip into um, pediatric and geriatric considerations, but for the most part, we're focusing mostly on adults. And this is because this is a core nurse practitioner program. Before we go out into our specialties, like minor psychiatry, some others are pedi pediatric nurse practitioners and some others are going to be geriatric practitioners. We have to do the general adult um, knowledge. And then after that, we go system by system in lecture and didactic, um, and that's how, that's how we narrow down um, and save time when we're doing a, um, an assessment over a patient that we know have a certain chief complaint. So the patient is not just coming in for a general um, annual exam, and let's say the patient has like a sore throat or a headache or urinary problems or a cough or whatever, um, then we start tailoring the exam so that it doesn't take up our whole 20 minutes. And then we have to go back again, head to toe. Uh, what my instructors have said is that I'm very charming. <laughs> I mean, come on, you can tell, right? Um, but I need to follow a specific systematic order. Uh, because even though you finish all the soap note writing courses during the course, or you've done all the necessary knowledge and, and passed all the tests, the written tests, you have to be able to pass this last OSCE exam practical of the day. If you don't and you fail this because you missed um, one red flag, you fail the entire course. I mean, it's very stressful for most people. Not, I mean, it was a little stressful for me because I had to do um, extra classes at another city um, for my other specialty, nurse practitioner specialty. But for many of us, we are full-time working registered nurses and um, one of the nurses that I work with, she was just so intelligent, but she was just very, she was a gutter, you know? She, everything she had to say was supposed to be right, and then nobody else's was correct but her. Um, and you know what? The week before we were gonna do our exam today, she broke down. Yeah, she was, I mean, I saw her coming in, we were practicing, we were practicing the exams if we were gonna do it last week. And, you know, usually we're given, we're put into a private room, uh, for only a couple of students for five minutes, we get we prepare to interview our patient. Uh, we do it in 20 minutes and then we come back out and then write the soap note. So in the middle of the first five minutes, I was, you know, like, obviously we weren't, we weren't each other's favorite classmates, but she goes in and she's like, oh my God. I could just hear her roll her eyes. And I was like, hey, um, I wasn't a huge fan of her either. So I just kept quiet. And then after about five minutes came up, and she was getting ready to go, and I said, the five minutes came by pretty quick, huh? And she goes, it's five minutes. And I was like, okay. Um, anyway, so then when I came out, she, I saw that she was on the floor in the hallway, bawling her eyes out. Now, this might not necessarily be from the test, but I'm sure she probably has, not I'm sure, but she might have had other, you know, 
terrible stress factors, you know, family problems, financial problems, whatever, in addition to taking this exam, but um, either way, I haven't seen her since, so I hope she's okay. Um, but it just goes to show that people, when they look and act tough on the outside, may not always be tough on the inside. And the, uh, the reverse might be correct. So, when I finally came time for my exam, um, it, I came in at 10.30. Uh, they, I wasn't there when they were signing up people, I was late. <laughs> so they said, oh yeah, you're going to be the first guy. You're, you're, you're at 10.30, is what many, a couple of my classmates said. And I was like, okay. So I came in, made sure I had my lab coat and something nice to wear and a tie and my badge and my stethoscope and pen light and pens. And then I came in and there was already a couple of students in there and I was like, oh, hey. They're like, hey, Howie. I'm like, Did you guys, are you guys, you know, waiting to be next? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, I thought I was the first one. And, like, and then it hit me. Like, my classmates were playing a practical joke. I was not the first one. I was like mid-morning. <laughs> So that, that helped kind of ease the tension for them and for me. Um, so I just spent like the next hour um, reviewing my notes on another classroom that was quiet and I just used a chalkboard or the whiteboard. All right, so my turn comes along and um, I start writing my, they put me down in a room and they give me five minutes to prepare. So I start writing down what the patient's complaint is, of course, patient's name demographics, their vital signs, and those are pretty much all that I'm given. Then I'm able to have like a note, a notebook called Common Signs and Symptoms Guide, and that's where I put my red flags, and I was allowed to write that down. So I transcribed that from my book into my clipboard with one piece of paper, and I did, you know, I put down what I was going to ask the patient. So I asked about demographics, vital signs, and then on this section, I wrote a uh, 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 chief complaint. Um, heading and then the other headings were I would say FEMA is my mnemonic so family history environment medication management um, medical history and allergies um, and so medication I also write down alcohol and tobacco and illicit drug use so that's my basic um, um, examination history questions then on this top area I have my old cart because anybody that has pain you have to do old cart which is O-L-D-C-A-R-T, which is a mnemonic for pain. And then I do my red flags. So I write down um, really, you know, pretty quickly. And, but I, was, I don't know what, exactly what time I had because I didn't look at my watch. I don't know why. And so I was like, well, I better write down exactly my exams that I'm going to do the patient. So I wrote down what I was going to do. So I, I, I strategized and I, and I figured, okay, this lady's complaining about sore throat. So I'm putting down... Um, I'm going to do a HINT exam, which is head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat, and then neck, HINTIN exam, and then do a basic cardiology and basic respiratory exam. I need to make sure that I do do the neck and the lymph nodes, and then check the pharynx. So I wrote that on my note on the bottom corner here, bottom right corner, but then, and then they said I had one minute left, and I'm like, oh crap, I missed one minute. So I didn't want to miss all, I wanted to list all my red flags, so I had it in a list. So I went back to the top right corner, and then added in the list below the old cart, and I barely made it. So definitely had to make sure that I, I practiced my, my timing for the five minutes there. Okay, so then they bring, they bring me out into the hallway and they said, okay, your 20 minutes are going to begin as soon as you knock on the door and you introduce yourself to the patient. So I went in there, knocked on the door, took a deep breath and became, you know, was very professional. And because I've been in um, medicine for a long, since I was like 19, um, I may not have had the same amount of education, medical education as I do now, but I've always had the experience of working with patients. And as goofy as I am with my friends, when I'm in the medical, um, when I'm in front of a patient, I try to be as professional as I can. I, I leave the jokes until after I know the patient. So usually I come in, knock on the door, wash my hands, pull out the curtains for privacy and I say, Hi, my name is Howie. I'm going to be your student nurse for the day. Um, I've heard that you've had problems with your sore throat. We're going to try to take care of you as best as I can. But first, uh, a, simple, a few simple questions. May I ask your full name? And tell me full name, date of birth, and, and your date of birth. And then I say, ah, and then uh, uh, how do you prefer to be called? You know, what gender, um, and what gender do, you, uh, do you, maybe if it was an LGBT, you would ask, like, what gender do you identify with? But I usually say, what gender do you identify with, and how would you, would you prefer to be called? 
I say, oh, I would like to be called Jerry. And then I ask the actress, um, patient, I said, okay, great. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to do a thorough history by asking you a, a few, you know, by asking you some questions. They may seem redundant, but I assure you they all relate to your complaint. Um, and, I'll, and then after that, I'm going to do, I'm going to do an examination on you, which involves a head to toe, um, but mostly just about head to, to your throat, listen to your heart, and then listen to your lungs. Um, I will have to ask you to uh, expose your gown um, just slightly. And if you're ever in pain or uncomfortable, uh, feel free to let me know and we'll stop and we'll try a different strategy. Also, during that exam, would you like to have a chaperone in here with you? Because the patient was female, I usually add that on. And they said, no, we're fine. I said, great. Um, now let me begin. So I, I do my questions and I ask my um, um, you know, family history, so the FEMA. So I have my history of physical, present illness. So what's your history? How did you get this thing? And you know, what, what have you been doing prior to that? Then I ask for family history, I ask for environment. Usually I like to do medical history below the HPI, but this is how my mnemonic works, so it's FEMA. So then I have uh, medical history and then medications, smoking, tobacco, or um, drinking or illicit drug use, and then I ask allergies. Of course, you have to ask allergies. That's Nursing 101. And then I go do my old cart and red flag questions. But this time, it's been about five to seven minutes, so I start kind of breezing through the red card questions. And after that's done, uh, usually the red card questions um, for the one, like let's say I had sore throat, so mine usually involved asking um, if you've had any recent travels, if you've... Um, had any night sweats or um, contact with anybody that, that have had tuberculosis? Um, have you had the flu shot? Have you had the new, um, pneumonia shot? This was if this is if the patient's older. And uh, when was your last menstrual period? Um, I didn't know why we asked that, but it turns out it's because if the patient ever needs any antibiotics, we'll, we'll need to know if the patient is pregnant or not. And um, uh, yeah, so those along that lines, like have you had any cough, is there any blood in that cough, you have any chest pain, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, um, and you know, all that nature. So once I got all those red flags down, then I say, okay, thank you so much for answering my questions. Now it's time to do your physical exam. What I'll be doing again, is, as I've said, is that I'll go from head to throat and then I'll listen to your heart and then listen to your lungs and then hopefully that'll be the end of the exam. Again, if there's any pain or if you feel uncomfortable, it is completely fine with me if you wish to stop or change the exam. Are you ready? My patients you know, usually says that they are. And I take a look at my notes real quick, get my stethoscope, and then do the exam on the particular order that I want. So that, of course, is from head to toe systematically. So if you do head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat, Usually if a patient has a neurological problem or a headache problem, then you have to do a full cranial nerve exam and that's a whole slew of other things that involve confrontation tests, EOMI, whisper tests, gag reflex, biting down, and um, a neck range of motion and shrugging your shoulders. I think I missed one, but anyway. Um, then you go down and then what I didn't do in the sore throat was I did palpate, um, check the good chin chest and range of motion for the neck just in case it was meningitis instead of threat, strep because you have to think about I, I kind of already had my diagnosis but I kind of had to think about what differential diagnosis tests I could do to rule out everything else um, but I forgot to have the patient swallow when I was checking her thyroid and then one of the red flags is, is that you have to put your stethoscope on the patient's skin. Do not do it over. I know we do that a lot for many patients because they're so, like, they're uptunded or they can't help you or you're, you don't have time. But when you're doing this exam, you make sure that the stethoscope is on the patient's skin. And then you do it with the bell if you're listening to the cardiac. So you're doing six, um, six spots on the front. Um, six, you know, to listen to the lobes, and then you're doing ape to man, so aortic, pulmonic, herb, point, tricuspid, and mitral, mitral um, auscultation for the heart, and then you do seven on the back. And if you think that the patient has problems with coughing or lung problems, then you do a more thorough exam, and that involves bronchophony or cophony, whisper, pectoraliloquy, and tactile frebitus. Um, for your lung exam, but the weird thing is is that you don't get the symptoms that you found until after you finish examining the patient because they give it to you in a card, so um, 
I kind of assumed that I had to do the thorough exam, lung exam, but I didn't really have to. All right, so after I got done, um, the patient gave me their card of symptoms of what I should have found um, if I was if this was a real scenario. But this isn't, so the, the card tells me what abnormal findings I found through my exam. And then it said, oh, the patient's sore throat has a positive exudate, um, red tonsils, and um, tender uh, lymph nodes, cervical lymph nodes. And then I write that down on my clipboard, and then I thank the patient, um, and I say, thank you very much for, for letting me examine you. Uh, currently, right now, what I believe that you have is that you have strep, possibly strep throat. What we're going to do for the plan is, is that we're going to do a swab culture, um, check to make sure that you don't have anything else, and then we may or may not need an x-ray. Um, and then I'll check with my preceptor to see if there's any other tests involved uh, and what else uh, we might have for you in your plan. Do you have any questions for me? And she says, no, thank you so much. And I said, thank you very much. It was a pleasure seeing you today. My name again is Howie. Have a great day. And then I wash my hands and I leave. And this time, then I have another 15 to 20 minutes to write down a soap note of what I found. So I take whatever symptoms that the patient actress gave me, and then I start writing down a soap note based on my notes that I did prior to seeing the patient. And I do it quickly, um, make sure that I have the same order, you know, which is uh, history, physical, present illness, patient name, date of birth, vital signs, chief complaint, and then I go into FEMA, which is family history, environmental history, medical history, medication management, allergies. And then, but before, uh, while I was doing that, I was getting ready to go into the room and I saw my instructor who was listening to me behind the tinted glass in the private patient room. And he goes, you did pretty well, but you missed one major red flag. And I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna fail this whole entire course. I have to repeat the whole entire thing for four months. And I'm like, oh no, is there anything I could do? And he's like, you can think about what you did, and if you did it, if you guessed correctly, I'll consider being le more lenient on you and letting you pass. And I was like, oh my god, oh my god. So I, while I was doing my soap note, I was just sweating bullets. Thank God he did it. He didn't say that in front of my other peers, and so you know, saved me from the embarrassment. But I was just so heartbroken. So I mean, he's sitting here trying to write out, write out the soap note. Um, just thinking, what, what the hell could I have missed? And then I thought, oh, maybe I forgot to ask if she was a smoker. So, um, I thought about that. And then once I finished my soap note, then they brought me to another room where the instructors could talk to me. And um, this instructor, who was my instructor prior to me getting my RN, who, you know, does like me, but he does, I feel like, holds me to a higher standard, um, walked in. And he's like, do you know what you did? And I was like... I'm sorry, and I I forgot to ask her if she smokes. That was on, but it was written down on my list. I just forgot to go over it because I must have forgotten it. And he he showed me the list. He's like, nope, that's not what you forgot. And I'm like, what? What could it be? Was it my HPI CC FEMA? You know. So I said history of present illness, um, uh, chief complaint, family history, environment. Uh, um, medical history, medications, allergies, and he's like, you said it, you guys over it. And I was like, what? You said it. And I said, medication? Family history? He's like, nope. I'm like, medications? He's like, nope, you asked that. And I go, allergies? And he's like, yes, we've had to remediate many, many of your classmates because they forgot to ask that very small, very innocent, but highly important red flag. And I'm like, I look at him and I'm like, but I did ask that, see? And he looks up my notes and he's like, oh, you did. And I was like, yeah, I mean, that's nursing 101. Of course I'm gonna ask about allergies. And he's like, oh, I guess you did. I'll have to look at the video. But in other words, you pass then. <laughs> so then we went over um, the objectives and, uh, and then we went over the uh, actress patient's feedback about, uh, on me. And um, so yeah, I was about four out of five for most things. I was very charming. However, I didn't follow a, 
a semi-logical order. So when I asked about the red flag questions, you know, I asked about vaccines and flu shots and pneumonia shots, pneumonia vaccines, and then I asked about travel and then last menstrual period. So that was kind of confusing for the patient and for the instructor. So my only feedback, big feedback really was that I just needed to be able to ask the questions in a more linear and logical order. Um, when I did the bronchophony and the gophony on the lung exam and did the extraocular muscles, um, that was not necessary. So I just I needed to cut that out as well. But I feel like I did that because um, it kind of made, made me feel safe. You know, it's okay to do extra tests, but it's not okay to go down weird rabbit holes. Like if you have a patient that's complaining about ear pain, and then you start palpating their abdomen and checking their their genitals. That's a red flag. That's, that you fail because <laughs> you went down a weird rabbit hole. But if you do a little extra stuff like the extraocular muscles for cranial nerves, um, it's sort of okay. Just don't go over the 20 minute time limit. So we talked about that. But other than that, um, I was very professional and charming. So I, could, of course, I think probably one of the more charming people because I've been seeing patients since I was like 17 um, in various medical roles. So. I passed! Yay! Now it's time to um, try to find a super amazing preceptor that I can latch onto and show them my practical exam skills, the OSCE skills now that I've passed it. Alright, um, I'll talk about my registered nurse um, orientation in the ICU later. Um, definitely still learning from that. I'm still learning to become a, re a good registered nurse in the critical care field. Um, so I'll talk about that in my other videos. But other than that, thank you so much for listening all this time. God, weird, right? I just talk and talk and talk, but that's what YouTube is for. Yes! Sign on to me uh, if you haven't already. Nurse Howie YouTube. You can also find me on Instagram, Nurse Howie. Uh, and on Twitter, at Howie Nurse. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Good luck in your own way, in your own uh, roles, classes, and careers. And uh, please feel free to comment, subscribe again to me, and I will see you next time. Nurse Howie, out!